The two most dangerous seductresses in the Bible. Number one, the Proverbs seductress. Two different words describe this woman, immoral and seductress. Proverbs chapter 7, verses 4 through 5. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend, so that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. An immoral person is loose and unfaithful to the marriage vows. Seductress means foreigner and adventurous. We can avoid immoral women and men by relying on the wisdom and power of God's Word. Through His Word, we gain insight into the tactics of temptation and sin and receive the spiritual grit essential to remain obedient in difficult times. The task of keeping men and women from sexual immorality sometimes seems impossible. Many factors contribute to this. We read, from the seductress who flatters with her words. We are drawn into sin by immorality's words. We need the remarkable power of God's words to keep us from the immoral woman or man. A young man is wandering around town with no apparent purpose or direction. Although he may come from a respectable family, his current focus is solely on enjoying himself. A skilled storyteller, Solomon, tells a convincing story. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 6 through 8 For at the window of my house I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing through the street near her corner, and he walks along the way to her house. The man was simple, young, and devoid of understanding. We read the term simple. As in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 4, this isn't stupidity, but inexperience and gullibility. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 22. How long, you naive ones, will you love simplistic thinking? And how long will scoffers delight themselves in scoffing? and fools hate knowledge. The simple need to be more educated in the ways of wisdom and need instruction. The young man is full of energy, passion, and overconfidence, but lacks wisdom. Pure living is a challenge faced by men and women of all ages, but it can be particularly difficult for young men. However, Everyone has their own unique obstacles to overcome in maintaining purity. Because he is simple and young, his reservoir of wisdom and understanding is empty. He is the one who must, at all costs, get wisdom. This one leads himself into temptation, with sad and familiar results. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there a woman met him, dressed as a prostitute, and sly and cunning of heart. She was boisterous and rebellious. She would not stay at home. He is like a moth flying to the flame. The awful moment of danger approaches when the temptation and opportunity to sin coincide. We should constantly pray that these two should never come together in our lives. The woman now appears, dressed to kill, painted, powdered, and perfumed. Beneath her charming exterior lies a sensuous secret of subtle heart. Proverbs chapter 7 verses 12 through 22 She is now in the streets, now in the public squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. 
Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence diligently, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Let's delight ourselves with caresses, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. At the full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. The more she talks, the more his resistance melts. With a little more flattery, she caused him to yield. The seductress had a natural talent for making the young man feel desired through her instincts or past experiences. By expressing her interest in him, she easily caught his attention. For some individuals, this level of seduction is all they need. She appeals to the young man's male ego as she flatters him and makes him think he's very special to her. What she's offering to him, she would never offer to anyone else. Wearsby. We read, For my husband is not at home. People commit sexual immorality when they feel there is little or no risk of being discovered. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. She succeeded in seducing him at the end of it all. The simple young man was enticed by her enticing speech and flattering lips to commit sexual sin with her. Through words and actions, she guided her victim. Although God wonderfully designs the body for the reception and assimilation of food, there is one certain thing. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Proverbs chapter 5 verses 8 through 14 Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Otherwise, you will give your vigor to others, and your years to the cruel one, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned possessions will go to the house of a foreigner. And you will groan in the end, when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, How I hated instruction, and my heart disdainfully rejected rebuke. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers, nor incline my ear to my instructors. I was almost in total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Solomon did not advise his son to remain in the immoral woman's presence and test his ability to resist her seduction. Keeping a distance from her house was the best offense. We must remove our way far from her, not only in presence, but also in heart and mind. We must put away the enticements common to our day and work for a mindset on things above. Number 2. The Seductress of Egypt To create the setting, Joseph, Jacob's son, had just been sold by his brothers. Moreover, the brothers had lied to Jacob. Jacob had come to terms with the fact that his son Joseph had died. To his brothers, he was gone for good, possibly even dead. However, Joseph was very much alive. Genesis chapter 39 verse 1 Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, in Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. Joseph found himself in a foreign place and culture, surrounded by a new language. Potiphar was no idiot, no matter what title you gave him. He was a man of seasoned military experience, with power over life and death. 
Joseph, on the other hand, not only adjusted to his new position, but thrived in it for one significant reason. That reason emerges in a beautiful phrase that appears a number of times in Joseph's story. And the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph's life was intricately intertwined with the sovereign God of Israel. He directed him. He favored him in Potiphar's eyes. God, without a doubt, was the key to Joseph's success. Not only did Potiphar's possessions end up under Joseph's watchful eye and guiding hand, but so did all of his benefits. What a great advancement. From a regular enslaved person, most likely one of the dozens in Potiphar's household, to running the household of Egypt's top military man. But it gets even better, for through Joseph, the Lord blessed Potiphar's house and all that he owned. Joseph was clearly doing well. But keep in mind that with greater success comes greater levels of trust, which inevitably leads to greater periods of vulnerability. At such times, we may expect temptation in prosperous days. It is there that the tempter's lies in wait. Beware. The Holy Spirit, who hovered over the writing of the biblical text, led to the smart and exact selection of words. As a result, Genesis 39.6 concludes with an unexpected but significant sentence. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. The New International Version reads, Joseph was well built and handsome. The scriptures don't mince words. Neither did Potiphar's wife. Genesis chapter 39 verses 7 through 9. And it came about after these events that his master's wife had her eyes on Joseph, and she said, Sleep with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look with me here. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put me in charge of all that he owns. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? He fought her seductive remarks, staring her down, determined not to submit. How could he do such a thing? Clarence Edward McCartney adds a realistic touch. This was no ordinary temptation. Joseph was a red-blooded young man, not a stone or a mummy in his twenties. It wasn't just one temptation on one day, but a series of them. How could this red-blooded young man in his late twenties say no? Because he was aware that his life was an open book in front of his God. By this point in his life, Joseph's God was more real to him than anything or anyone else on the planet. He was in a secret chamber, absolutely safe with the master's wife who had set up this anticipated moment of lusty delight for him. He was a dashing young bachelor. They were by themselves. Yielding would have been the most natural thing in the world. But according to Joseph, this is a grave evil, a horrific offense against his God. As a result, he walked away. Genesis chapter 39 verse 10 Though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. This was a devilish seductress. She was compelled to be with Joseph. All of his discourse about the moral reasons for resisting just fueled her determination. She was unconcerned about the purity of her marriage or the trust between her husband and this young man. She was only concerned with satisfying her physical desires right now. 
If you are living in the delusory belief that if you resist temptation, it will go away, break it right now. In reality, when you think like this, you become an even more attractive target for the tempter. Furthermore, keep in mind that the tempter desires the recognized personality, the one who is quoted by others, the successful individual, the trusted spouse, and the godly soul. That's why it's not unexpected that Potiphar's wife pursued Joseph with such tenacity. He was a hoot. Get him, and she'd accomplished something. But Joseph refused to budge. And aren't we glad he did? The tiniest show of interest in her would have sealed his fate. The allure of sexual lust acts like a magnet, drawing two sudden and fierce forces toward each other, inner desire and outward bait. Let's face it, if you live in the real world, you can't escape the bait. In fact, even if you manage to isolate yourself from the outside world, your mind will not allow you to escape the outer bait. However, keep in mind that there is no sin in the bait. The sin is in the bite. You have been lured when the lust of another tempts you to give in to your own lust, so much so that your resistance weakens. You've succumbed to the allure of temptation. Joseph exemplifies the secret beautifully. He refused to surrender. Genesis chapter 39 verses 11 through 12 Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the people of the household was there inside. So she grabbed him by his garment, saying, Sleep with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. There were no servants in sight. Why is this so? Potiphar's wife might have dispatched them on errands to get them out of the way. Whatever the reason, she was alone in the house with Joseph, and she made another move. Only this time, she was not going to take no for an answer. She went beyond verbal advances and physically seized Joseph's hand. She clung so firmly to him that as he yanked away and rushed out into the street, he left his outer robe in her clutches. What a clear picture. What a practical way to shine a light on the truth from Joseph's life. Mrs. Potiphar's passion was transformed into rage. This scorned woman now desired only vengeance. To accomplish this, she constructed a bogus case against Joseph based on circumstantial evidence, his robe. Genesis chapter 39, verses 16 through 20. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave, whom you brought to us, came in to me to make fun of me. But when I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Watch closely as a plot against He was, after all, the commander of the guard in the primary execution. Do you think he would have just imprisoned a slave if he suspected him of attempting to attack his wife? He would have killed him on the spot, in my opinion. The crime was not tolerated in ancient Egypt. Instead of torturing or killing Joseph, Potiphar had him placed into the jail, the location where the king's prisoners were imprisoned. Potiphar seemed to be primarily irritated at having lost his best servant as a result of an unfaithful marriage. Whatever the case may have been, Joseph was still imprisoned. 
Consider what was going through Joseph's mind at this point, just after he was imprisoned. He was not only innocent, but he had repeatedly rejected obvious temptation. He'd never read Genesis 41 before. He had no idea what would happen in the end. He didn't know that in a matter of years, he would be Prime Minister of Egypt. All the man knew at this painful moment was that he had done what was right and had suffered wrong for it. Time dragged by. Days turned into months. He was again unfairly rejected, forgotten, totally helpless. But somehow, in the midst of this unfair situation, Joseph sensed that Jehovah's hand was in all this. Joseph, you're mine. Just wait. I'm with you. I'm not ignoring you or rejecting you. You will be a better man, Joseph, because of this accusation against you. I'm not through preparing you for my service. Does that sound too pious? Are those meanderings too much for you to swallow? Am I off base here? Not if we believe the rest of the story recorded in this chapter. Genesis chapter 39 verses 21 through 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. And the warden of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison so that whatever was done there he was responsible for it. The warden of the prison did not supervise anything under Joseph's authority, because the Lord was with him, and the Lord made whatever he did prosper. Have you noticed the important phrase, the Lord was with him? Joseph was in the hands of the Lord. However, the relationship was mutual. Joseph, too, obeyed God. Instead of being bitter and angry, he put God first. As a result, he thrived, even while imprisoned. Amazing! It's possible that you're currently confronted with temptation. Maybe you've already yielded. Some may be thinking to themselves, So far, I've been able to resist the allure of sensual temptation, but I need your support to keep going. But no one watching this can say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. As a result, let me conclude this with some practical advice for everyone who reads these words by the grace of God. Four conditions must be met if you intend to avoid temptation. I'll cut to the chase and then explain each one. First, it's important to not let your situation weaken you. Second, don't be fooled by someone trying to persuade you. Third, you must not be gentle with your emotions. Fourth, you must not be confused with the immediate results. The reality revealed in Joseph's life applies to all of us whether we are married or unmarried, divorced or remarried, man or woman, young or elderly. Don't linger in any circumstance, no matter how enticing, delicious, or briefly delightful the bait appears. Claim the miraculous strength that comes from knowing Jesus Christ and stand strong in His might as you operate under His authority. Decide to be a Joseph right now, in this exact now. Make up your mind to join his ranks, and then refuse from now on. You will yield if you do not. It's only a matter of time before it happens.